Hello and welcome to the GBC webcast. My name is Mulham and I am the communication officer for the GBC. We wanted to talk about including age, gender and disability in the HNO and HRP. And for today's webcast, we are going to be focusing only on one element, which is, the, which is including disability in the HNO and HRP. Um, to help me here, I have with me Kirsten Lang, who is the Senior Disability Inclusion Advisor with uh, UNHCR. We're also joined by uh, three panelists. I have with me Kopal Mitra, who is joining us from New York today. Kopal is the Program Specialist on the Children with Disability at UNICEF. Uh, from Geneva, we have Kimberly Late. Uh, she's the Humanitarian Affairs Officer in the Need and Response Analysis section of OCHA. We also have with us uh, Karim El Bayar, who is the Partnership Manager at the Center for Humanity Data at OCHA. Uh, we're also joined by our colleagues from the field who are giving us their perspective on this topic. Uh, we have Pauline Schreibler, who uh, works for human Humanity and Inclusion in Syria, and she is the Technical Advisor uh, on Data with uh, Humanity and Inclusion. And uh, we're also going to hear a cl cluster perspective on this. And uh, we're joined by the, um, the cluster coordinator in Myanmar, uh, Jalaldin Salducci. Uh, she's joining us today from Yangon in Myanmar. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for being, for being here with us. I'm going to give the floor to uh, Kopal to start with his uh, presentation first. And I'm going to share also his, his present presentation on the screen. Uh, thank you, Molan. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, and thank you, colleagues, for joining today. Uh, it's, it's great to be, to be here. Uh, as uh, was just uh, introduced, the, the topic uh, for today is how do we strengthen disability uh, in in uh, HNOs, HRPs, um, and ensure inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action. Uh, I will uh, essentially focus on what would a good HNO and HRP look like. But before I do that, let me briefly uh, give you a flavor of, of why are we talking about this issue today. Um, let me take you uh, through a couple of uh, data points that we have on how many persons with disabilities are there in the world or in, uh, within a certain population. So uh, estimates suggest, and these are well established, that 15% of the population have some type of disability, and which amounts uh, to a figure of 1 billion people with disabilities in the world. So you have it on the slide, and within that, uh, it. Uh, it, uh, we have figures of, of women with disabilities, one in 10 children have a disability, but what is uh, most important uh, for this discussion today is that in humanitarian situation, the figure is even higher, because as we know, emergencies often result in, uh, in more people with disabilities within the population. So figures suggest that about 20%, and if, uh, sometimes even higher, of the population have a disability. So it's a huge number. And uh, uh, Mulan, the next slide. Uh, so what is the situation? So well, once we dig a little deeper, we know that, uh, that persons with disabilities are one of the most uh, uh, disproportionately affected in, uh, in emergencies. At the same time, they, are, they remain one of the most excluded from humanitarian assistance. If you see uh, persons with disabilities are four to 10 times uh, more likely to experience violence. More than half of children with disabilities currently are out of school. Uh, at the same time, uh, and, and in terms of livelihood, it is the same scenario. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, studies suggest that uh, more than 75% of persons with disabilities, according to a survey, uh, do not or had difficulty or could not access humanitarian assistance. So the overall message is that the population is huge, 15 to 20 percent, and at the same time, uh, they, while facing disproportionate risk, they, the current scenario is that they, are, they remain mostly excluded from humanitarian assistance. Now, all these factors have led to disability being, and the next slide uh, 
being a growing priority uh, within the uh, 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 emerging as a growing priority. Now, why do I say that? If you see the sustainable development goals, for the first time, it has explicit references to disability, more than uh, seven targets and 11 indicators specifically referencing disability. The World Humanitarian Summit saw a lot of traction and momentum on disability and a charter on inclusion of persons with disabilities was launched, which was widely endorsed. Uh, the interagency standing committee has uh, formed a task team uh, to, uh, uh, to, to develop global guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action. And uh, if, you, if you have noticed, uh, donors increasingly have started uh, asking about, about how humanitarian action is, is reaching out to persons with disabilities in a systematic manner. And uh, for example, DFID, DFID has a specific target on disability in their, in their humanitarian investment program, which provides four uh, resources and support to uh, most of the uh, key humanitarian uh, agencies within the UN system. So there is a growing priority uh, on the issue. Uh, now, uh, the next slide, I'll just take you briefly through uh, what would a good humanitarian needs overview look like uh, uh, for persons with disabilities. And there are essentially three points there. Uh, first of all, any humanitarian needs overview, HNO, uh, would, would be stronger in terms of inclusion if it gives an analysis of how the crisis uh, differently affects persons with disabilities. Uh, we see a tendency of HNOs to include persons with disabilities and club them among a list of vulnerable groups, which is often not very helpful because uh, the, the risks, the barriers are different. And, uh, and without an analysis of, of who are at risk of what and why, it will be difficult uh, to design an effective response. The, the second point that I would like to touch on is uh, the identification of specific barriers that persons with disabilities face to access uh, assistance and which in turn heightens their risk and vulnerability. So any uh, good HNO would, would identify the specific barriers. And lastly, uh, the consideration of intersectionality. How does other factors like age, gender, other contextual factors interact with disability and, and heighten risk? and vulnerability. So these are essentially key points. If you are able to address, our HNO will be much more inclusive and stronger in terms of, of disability inclusion. Uh, and uh, I'll now go to the last slide on humanitarian response plans, HRPs. What would a good HRP, disability inclusive HRP look like? And there are four points essentially I'd like to touch on briefly. The first point is, uh, and that's the tendency again we have seen, Rather than club disability or persons with disabilities among a host of uh, groups to be prioritized, it would be much more useful if we list out the actions. What are the actions uh, that, that would be taken to address the barriers that we spoke about in the last slide? Uh, how, how would the barriers be addressed uh, to make the, the response more inclusive? And uh, that, that is extremely important. The second point is to adopt a twin track approach. And the rationale behind it is that persons with disabilities are first and foremost people. They are part of the population and a majority of their needs are the same as any other person within the population, affected population. So uh, in terms of their access to healthcare, access to water, access to food, uh, at the same time, people with disabilities will have some specific needs. Uh, for example, access to assistive devices, access to rehabilitation. So any, any comprehensive response would, would adopt a twin track approach in, in ensuring that the general assistance made, make, uh, made available to the population is inclusive of and accessible to persons with disabilities. At the same time, there are some targeted interventions which specifically address the specific needs of persons with disabilities. The third point that I would uh, like to uh, highlight is the importance of adopting participatory approaches to consult persons with disabilities, to include them in the planning and response. And with their lived experience, what we have seen is they are able to substantively contribute and make any planning and response much more um, richer. And the fourth point and the last one is 
the inclusion or consider, considering to include uh, disability and accessibility within the results framework uh, as uh, at the output or at the activity level and to uh, and to uh, provide some specific uh, actions that could be taken to reach out to persons with disabilities during during the crisis so i'll end there and hand you over to molam who will uh, um, uh, take you to the rest of the presentations today thank you so much thank you so much kapal for your presentation um, I would like now to move to Kimberly. Kimberly, she's gonna um, walk us through how di how disability included in the new HNO and HRP guidance. Kimberly, please go ahead. Uh, Kimberly, we uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear us, Kimberly? It does help if I take myself off mute, doesn't it? <laughs> it probably does. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you for that. Sure. And I and I said some some very wise things, unfortunately, I'm while I was sure. on mute. I'm pretty sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I feel like in order to best highlight the efforts um, underway this year to strengthen disability inclusion within the HPC process. We would benefit from um, knowing just a little bit about how the process has changed overall this year because these elements um, have provided some very useful entrees for strengthening the disability elements. So um, I'd like to point out five quickly differences or, or, or efforts to strengthen the HPC overall this year which link very much to our discussion today. So historically, we've seen um, weak linkages between the humanitarian needs overview or the needs analysis and the subsequent programming within the HRP. So the, the revised process this year very much looks to address that. And in fact, it's structured in a way that you cannot do your HRP unless you can show very clearly um, where the needs have been identified within the HNO. There is also a real effort to go beyond the sectoral focus and to strengthen joint intersectoral analysis to better understand the relationship between needs and to program accordingly. This is recognizing that rarely, if ever, would you meet an individual who has, uh, has only a single sector or cluster need, only needs food or water or health care assistance. The third is an effort to increase the depth and breadth of analysis beyond the who, what, and where to look more at the why and the when. What are the underlying risks and vulnerabilities that are contributing to current and future needs? And what are the capacities and coping mechanisms? What are those needs that are immediate? And what are those needs that are chronic? And this particularly has opened up a very interesting area for us to look um, in greater depth at disability inclusion. We're also seeing within the HRP a shift at looking towards humanitarian outcomes, not just defining what we intend to do, but the changes or the improvements in people's lives that we wish to see as the result of the efforts that we're, that we're, we're dedicating. So we're, we're, we're looking for a shift in thinking there towards results and an accompanying strengthening of monitoring systems in order to look at that. Look at how the situation evolves, how the lives of people are evolving, and the influence that the humanitarian initiative is having on that, if at all. So that's a quick overview. But what does that mean for us and our efforts towards strengthening disability inclusion? So. What we've seen is within both the HNO and the HRP templates, and I would say most notably the, the HNO, um, is significantly increased visibility of, of where do we put disability within these documents. So we would often hear, we have some information, but where do we put it? It's now very clearly outlined within the document, um, front and center, both the statistical elements and then also more of the narrative and some of the more analytical elements as well. 
Um, we've restructured the way the analysis is, is presented so that not only is there a clear space to show quantitatively our estimates or known figures related to disabilities, but also to look at some of the barriers and the capacities within some of the subsections where we're talking about critical problems related to physical and mental well-being, being those related to protection, and those related to resilience and recovery. So it offers us the opportunity to present um, uh, the vulnerabilities as well as the capacities and the resilience of those with disabilities through, through, through different lenses in the document. Also within the step-by-step -step guidance, there was an effort to clearly identify how this could be done. Not just where do we put it, but what is the process or some of the thinking that we need to go through in order to arrive at these, these conclusions that would inform our programming. So from the outset of the entire HPC process, um, we're saying that you need to start um, with the HC and the HGT reflecting a bit on what we already know. We have a tendency to start out from the beginning every year as if, as if it, it's all new, when in fact we all know that we predominantly work in protracted crises these days. There's a lot we do know already. Um, so we're saying, let's look at what we know. What do we already know about the needs that are ongoing, those of persons with disabilities and, and the greater needs as well? Um, what are their barriers? Um, what are the vulnerabilities? And what can we look at to enhance resilience? What are we doing already and is it effective? At this time, we're also asking that there be, that disabilities be considered within the, within the scope and the focus, the boundaries that are being set for the forthcoming greater detailed analysis. It also highlights the importance of identifying the data indicators and other information that are required to answer these questions and the sources, as well as agreeing on agencies and clusters or sectors' roles and responsibilities. Now, the new um, guidance on disability inclusion within the HNOs and the HRPs is particularly helpful because it also provides lists and information on existing data or data sources where information might be secured, uh, some quantitative and qualitative information that could be utilized within the needs analysis process, recognizing that while this data may not be fully complete, it can give us an initial idea on which we may be able to subsequently build through securing other sources of information, whether secondary or primary data collection. The step-by-step -step guide also highlights um, the need to ensure that disability considerations are included within the joint intersectoral analysis, as mentioned previously. So in analyzing the needs and the risks, considering specifically how the impacts of the hazard affect persons with disabilities differently. Now, I'd really like to point out that a strong analysis will aim to identify and describe the factors contributing to heightened risk, rather than merely identifying the groups at risk or the risks themselves. And this is really a key element that will play into the HRP and programming. Because that will help us to, to define strategic objectives in a way that will promote both inclusivity and specific programming where it's adequate. Now, as I noted, as you flip through the HNO and the HRP templates, you'll see specific elements, specific points dedicated towards disability inclusion. And we'll also find links for it to additional guidance, which can provide greater depth and, and specific detail as needed. And over to you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, now I'm moving to Karim El Bayar, who is going to walk us through the importance of data on persons with disabilities. Karim, over to you. 
Thanks very much. I'm just going to take one second to share my screen here. <clears throat> sure, go ahead. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. We can. Okay, great. Um, well, so thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to the group today. Um, I, my name is Karim al Bayar, as we mentioned, and I'm with OCHA's Humanitarian Data Exchange, or the Center for Humanitarian Data. Uh, the Humanitarian Data Exchange launched in July of 2014 and is dedicated to increasing the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. And of course, um, that includes disability data, which is the subject that we're talking about today. Um, since our launch in 2014, we have grown to include now almost 9,000 data sets from 248 locations and over 1,100 sources. So we're really pleased with the growth and the increasing use of the humanitarian data exchange by humanitarian organizations around the world. On HDX, or the Humanitarian Data Exchange, you can find country pages, like the one you're seeing here. This is the country page for South Sudan that brings together a number of key st statistics and data sets from more than 30 organizations, as you can see here. They're made available for humanitarian um, workers to use in the ways that they see fit. We can also find organization pages, like this one here for the World Food Program which is what you're looking at now is their, their global food prices database. And we have this interactive map here where you can click on various countries and you can actually download the database to see food prices changing over time. Um, we also have for the ver very first time this year, and we're very pleased with this, all of the humanitarian needs overviews. So all of the HNOs for 2019 are now to be found on HDX. And you can see all of the, the data that informs the HNOs. Um, as we are now moving toward a new system of HNOs and HRPs, humanitarian response plans that include disability data, we're hoping to see disability data start to come in to the platform to humanitarian data exchange for the first time. Um, we are, as part of that work, rolling out something that we're calling a data completeness grid. And you can see that here for Som Somalia. We now have a data completeness grid up and running for 13 countries, but we hope to have it up and running for all of the countries in which OCHA is operational by the end of this year. And you can see that what we're trying to do is to make it very clear what key data sets are required in order to improve humanitarian response and respond effectively and efficiently um, to the needs of affected people. And so what we're doing is making it very clear what data sets are available and what data sets are missing for each country. And then we make it very easy to click through and find those data sets. So what, what can you do once the data is actually online? Um, there's a lot that can be done. And in fact, what we're trying to do is to create this marketplace where humanitarian organizations can view each other's data, um, can combine their data in ways that we haven't thought of, um, and can think about how to improve their operations. But there's also some interesting applications that you can use once you've got all the data in one location. And this is an example from a page that we built for the Rohingya refugee response. And what you can see here is an interactive map. It's layering a satellite image that was acquired from a private sector provider, along with map, mapping data that came in for the, the refugee camp that was done by an NGO, and then location information for various humanitarian assistance. So you can see that we've layered uh, the location of schools. We've layered the location of medical clinics, nutrition services, women-friendly spaces. All of that came from different organizations. But by putting all of this together on one page, you allow decision makers and beneficiaries to see more clearly what the needs are, if there are camps where there are missing resources or there are camps where there are too many resources for the people that are there, and it helps to make allocation decisions more effectively and more efficiently. And so that's really just a small example of the kind of thing that can be done once you make data more available. Um, we're now making a big push to acquire onto the platform on the Humanitarian Data Exchange more disability data. And I'm very pleased that one of the, the organizations we'll be hearing from later today, Humanity and, and Inclusion, or formerly Handicap International, has just launched their page on the Humanitarian Data Exchange. And they're making available some very interesting data sets. So here you see that their new page and some of the data that is made available, and some of the interactive mapping that HI has made available for the, the wider humanitarian community. So you can see here, this is demographic and disability information about Syrian refugees in Jordan and Lebanon um, who have disabilities. And so this is very powerful information and very useful information that all of us in the humanitarian community can rely on to make our response more effective and more efficient. 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we're really making a big push for disability data, and we'd love for organizations that are working with disability data to come onto the platform. There's a number of resources and support that we can provide in addition to support with data visualization. There's also some tools that you can make available, or tools that are available rather on HDX that can be used by organizations that share their data there. And here's a, a very quick sort of view of some of them. We have a data check tool. We have a quick chart tool that allows you to create live interactive charts from your data very quickly. Um, and really, as I mentioned, we, we'd like to see as much humanitarian data as possible, as much disability data as possible onto the platform so that it can be combined with other data sources, made available to decision makers, made available to other humanitarian organizations, and hopefully make um, humanitarian response more effective, more efficient, and more responsive to the needs of all affected people, including affected people with disabilities. So we'd be very pleased to work with any organization that wants to come onto the platform and wants to learn more about how to share their data. We, I don't have enough time to touch on this today, but we also have a fairly robust data policy program in which we are helping organizations to remove sensitive or personally identifiable information before they share it. Um, so we can help organizations think through some of the implications of sharing their data as well. And we'd be very happy to field any questions or support any organization that needs it. You can contact us at centerhumdata at un.org. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karim. And thank you again to Kimberly and Kopal. I'm going to move now to uh, our colleagues from the field. And I'm going to start with Pauline. Uh, Pauline, please go ahead. Yes, I'm going to share my screen as well. Are you able to see it? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me today. I'm going to be talking to you about a project that Humanitarian Inclusion has been implementing on collecting disability data in humanitarian action. Um, and so it was a three-year project that we've implemented. Uh, it was composed of an action research that we did in Jordan and Syria, um, the Philippine and DRC, um, to test and assess a tool called the Washington of Question to collect data on person with disability. Um, we used the results of our action research to create uh, learning materials uh, designed for humanitarian actors on the use of the, of the Washington of Question. And we've also been doing a lot of uh, dissemination and advocacy to kind of create a a consensus around collection of data on person with disability. So today I'm going to kind of talk you through um, the key findings uh, from the project. Um, so first of all, when we talk about disability data in humanitarian context, um, depending on the objective and the intervention, it can mean different things. Uh, it can mean data to determine who is in need of medical services, for example. It can mean data to determine who is at risk of exclusion or restricted participation. It can be data on accessible facility. It can be data on barriers. Um, so it can be a lot of different things. And data can also be collected differently. It can be collected quantitatively or qualitatively. Um, when we talk about disability data as well, it's important to, to remember that it does exist. So there are disability data out there. And more and more, uh, as Karim showed, it's, it's encouraging. Um, the one of the struggle at the moment with, with secondary data is the quality and the comparability uh, of secondary data. So, so the graph on, on the screen shows kind of data from the last maybe four years uh, on the Syrian refugee with disability in Jordan. And depending on the sources, um, you know, percentage varies from maybe 2.5% to uh, over 25%. So there's a lot of data out there but because it was collected differently, kind of leads to different results and, and it can be difficult uh, to use. When we talk about disability data as well, it means again different things depending on the stage of uh, the humanitarian program cycle that we're in. So we've talked about the H and OHRP today. This is a very good entry point for collecting data and understanding the situation of person with disability. The other data on disability can be collected at other stage uh, of the response. Um, one of the tools that we've been using to collect uh, quantitative data on person with disability was the Washington Group short set of questions. So we've tested this a lot with a wide range of humanitarian actors in the country mentioned previously um, to kind of see how they work. So this is a set of six questions. 
um, that was designed by the Washington Group on Disability Statistics. It's a group that was commissioned by the UN Statistical Commission um, to address the lack of comparable data and disability and come up with a tool that is short to be integrated initially in national censuses or disability survey at population level and also a tool that's very easy to use. So they came up with those six questions um, and for each question you have four answer category. Um, plain language um, is one of the features of this question and also the fact that it does not use the word disability as it is a word that carries stigma that can affect um, the quality of the data. Further down the line, they started developing other sets of questions, realizing that it was difficult to capture disability with, with only six questions at times. So the short set of questions is, is what I've showed previously, but since then they've created an enhanced short set of questions, which includes questions about anxiety and depression, they also have an extended set of questions they've created with UNICEF, um, the child functioning module, and they're looking at more and more modules. I can think of inclusive education, for example. So further modules are being developed depending on, on different features of the, of the data collection. Um, so using the Washington Group question or collecting quantitative data uh, in humanitarian action, requires a lot of planning, uh, we found um, in the research. And for the reason I've highlighted before, it, it depends on what type of information is required. Um, it depends on what stage of the program cycle we're in. And there is also a lot of capacity building uh, needed for humanitarian actors to, to be able to, to not understand it, but be able to use and apply it properly, as well as being able to design a tool uh, with the Washington question and, and analyze the data. So we found that it was important at the start, before the data collection even starts, um, to take time to plan and really understand what information, for what purpose, and make sure the training um, is done accordingly. Um, one of the common mistakes we found with the Washington group was one to using more in a medical way to try to diagnose a person with disability, which is not what they were created for. They were created to, to identify people at risk of restricted participation, so at risk of exclusion, and uh, not to identify people with magical condition. This is not to say that this information is not useful, but it, it, it's a different purpose. When we think about inclusive programming, we're thinking of a person at risk um, of not being included in the response. So if, if the information needed was a more magical nature, a, a different tool uh, was recommended. Uh, we also found that it was used as a targeting tool try to kind of select um, a population for, for humanitarian response. It was not designed, again, in, in that in mind. That's not saying that it cannot be used in addition with other criteria, but we felt like maybe more, more testing uh, needed to be done. We also found that there was some specificity in, in humanitarian action that might have required the collection of additional information. Um, so, Sometimes actors were interested in to understand uh, the temporality, so how long had the person been experiencing difficulty for, whether in addition there was medical condition, um, the cause of the difficulty, or the barriers um, that the person is facing when uh, accessing uh, services. So further information needed, maybe more questions uh, had to be asked as part of the data collection exercise. Um, we also find that the entry point for collecting data and person with disability might be different depending on the type of, of crisis in disaster risk reduction. For example, we also often saw it used as part of preparedness. In conflict, a lot of needs assessment, maybe more registration, and in protected crisis, often as part of, of monitoring. Um, we globally found there was kind of different use of disability data for inclusive programming. So it was very useful to understand demographic, um, the population the prevalence of person with disability in, in a given population. It was also useful for organizations to be able to measure access of person with disability to the services or activity. And it was also useful to disaggregate key outcome performance indicator by disability as well as sex, age, and, and other factors to kind of understand how an intervention was, was performing. Um, I've got some brief example here that I'm going to go through quite quickly. Population data, this is an example of the HNO, for example, kind of telling us um, at the bottom of the screen the 
prevalence of person with disability uh, in the population. Um, this is more vulnerability in this assessment stage in Jordan. Again, by integrating the Washington Group question, they cannot understand um, the relationship between disability and another factor. Here, for example, um, food security. Um, could be also integrating in more case management uh, features of so registration activity uh, to kind of understand access of the different group, uh, including person with disability or in monitoring to understand more disaggregation of outcome. And here it was um, outcome of food security and kind of the difference, if any, between person with disability and, and the general population. So all of those were different applications that were kind of helpful to design an inclusive response. So collecting um, data using the Washington group it, it is not everything. It gives an indication of a person with disability whether they're rich, whether they able to access. But to be able to implement an inclusive response, it's important, and it was stressed by Gopal at the start, to understand about barriers and facilitator. So for example here, and this is also one of the data sets on, on HDX, um, a survey was done in Jordan and Lebanon to understand access of children with disability um, to education. Um, there was a different level of access um, shown by the data and the use of the Washington group. So that was using the child functioning module developed by, by UNICEF. Um, but the further question and barrier were then asked um, to the family. And, and you can see that by the graphic, which shows the different barriers. Um, for children with disability, the main barriers was overcrowded classroom, which is 25.4% of respondents. Overcrowded classroom was only the third barrier mentioned with children without disability, only 11.2%. So understanding kind of the barriers faced by, by the different group is very helpful to then plan the response and ensure inclusive um, education. Um, all of this and more is available on the learning toolkit that um, has been designed by Humanity and Inclusion, and I'm sure I'll be able to, to share the, the resources with you all uh, as part of this webcast. It includes an e-learning, a, a training pack for enumerators, and a lot of supporting resources um, helping to guide uh, the use of the Washington Group question and kind of reflect on what is uh, inclusive programming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pauline. Pauline was um, joining us from Syria. And uh, now from Syria, we go to Myanmar. And uh, we're going to hear from our cluster coordinator over there, Geraldine. Geraldine, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Molaham. So I'm happy to share a little bit of the uh, Myanmar experience in terms of um, including um, disability in, in humanitarian action. I would like to start, if you allow me, with uh, some very quick background information on the humanitarian situation in Myanmar, just to set the scene. Um, there are over 900 people in need of humanitarian assistance across the country, including 245,000 IDPs, many of whom are also stateless. According to, to the government da data, the nation's disability rate is 4.6%. This represents, roughly speaking, 2.3 million people. This is far below uh, WHO's 15% ratio. This is also below the estimated 20% that uh, Gopal shared with us um, earlier. Um, and Myanmar is also one of the countries in the world that is most affected by landmines, uh, with 9 out of 14 regions that are contaminated with 25% of the uh, victims uh, being children. Um, internally displaced persons, as well as stateless communities, are exposed to a wide range of protection risks. I won't go into this detail, uh, but um, it goes without saying, unfortunately, that among those IDPs, stateless communities, persons with disabilities are even more marginalized and even more vulnerable to, uh, to, uh, to this protection risk. Now, um, what have we been doing in Myanmar uh, around the issue of disability inclusion in humanitarian action? Since 2017, the protection sector has made um, disability inclusion one of its key uh, priorities, and you will see that this is reflected in the 2017, 18, 19 HNO and HRP. Um, not only in the protection sector's chapter, where we do list, uh, at least in the 2019 uh, HRP, we do list specific activities targeting persons with disabilities, but also in the documents chapeau, 
uh, where we um, highlighted the needs and vulnerabilities of the persons with uh, of persons with disabilities, and we also made the strengthening of data collection and analysis on the situation of persons with disabilities. Uh, this has been also prioritized uh, among the six actions for response monitoring in in, in our 2019 uh, HRP. So. Since 2017, uh, all through 2018, um, we have focused our efforts mainly around data collection and protection mainstreaming, and I have to say to a lesser extent uh, uh, on targeted interventions for persons with disabilities. I will not give you an exhaustive presentation of all the work that has been done, but I just want to focus on a few examples. Starting with uh, data collection, uh, this very, um, this relates directly to uh, the, the previous presentation. Uh, we have uh, been uh, collecting data, um, one, um, on really identifying persons with disabilities with a very strong focus, I have to say, on IDP camps in the various contexts we are operating in. Um, and this has been done regularly uh, through camp profiling exercise by, by CCCM uh, actors primarily. And we've been working very closely with, uh, with HI, uh, which provided trainings on the Washington Group set of questions, the short set of questions, uh, to, uh, to uh, our enumerators. Um, so we have, quite, um, we have some data at the household level on the size and demographics of the affected population for which we want to prioritize interventions. We also uh, did um, uh, collect information on the protection risk faced by persons with disabilities. We've done that through, uh, we've revised recently the protection risk analysis. Uh, when I say we, it's the protection sector. Um, but we've also collected uh, information through regular protection monitoring and also through um, our protection incident monitoring system. So we do have some evidence-based data on the risk that persons with disabilities are most exposed to. Uh, again, I won't go into the detail, but certainly physical insecurity in conflict areas we have, we keep receiving reports of persons with disabilities being left behind in the conflict areas, women and girls with disabilities being exposed to gender-based violence. We have very high level of extortions that persons with disabilities are victim of, very low level of school attendance, and so on and, and so forth. The third area um, of data uh, collection has been really, uh, there's been a, a lot of efforts made in Myanmar in 2017, 2018 um, on collecting data on the barriers that persons with disabilities face in accessing humanitarian assistance and services. And we've done that through, I would say, three main um, uh, means, post-distribution monitoring exercises, we also have uh, collecting that data through our complaints and response mechanisms that are available uh, in all IDP camps. In some areas, we have much more sophisticated uh, CRM system than in others that do allow us to have good um, analysis of the complaints. And the third um, way we've been collecting or analyzing the barriers that persons with disabilities face in accessing assistance and services um, have been a standalone barriers assessment that have been conducted by CCCM uh, actors, protection and education actors. Uh, and I have to say the two main really actors who have been conducting those barriers assessments are uh, HI and, and, and DRC. Um, the, the, prior to these assessments, again, partners were trained on the Washington group sets of questions. Um, so those, those assessments were quite critical in terms of not only assessing the barriers that persons with disability face in accessing uh, assistance and services across the board in all areas, health, food, wash, et cetera. But these assessments were quite key in terms of formulating really um, recommendation for all humanitarian actions, uh, uh, humanitarian actors, sorry, that aim to improve um, access to, to assistance and services. But there are also recommendations on how to improve the social inclusion of persons with disabilities, which has also been identified as a major uh, gap uh, in Myanmar, as I am sure it is in, in other operations. 
Uh, now, we are not collecting data for the sake of collecting data. Um, this is something we also have to be very careful about. Um, why we use, uh, why we collect data. So, how have we been using all this information and in particular um, uh, to design quality programmatic interventions for persons with disabilities in Myanmar. So I would like to touch on two key areas that we've been working on, protection mainstreaming on the one hand and standalone project for persons with disabilities on the other hand, which I think is commonly referred to as the, the twin track approach. Protection mainstreaming has also been a key, key focus since 2016 in Myanmar. Um, we have organized a number of training of trainers. We have carried out regular follow-up trainings on protection mainstreaming for frontline workers from all clusters and sectors. We do have a list of dedicated protection mainstreaming focal points in the field. We have developed cluster-specific checklists on protection mainstreaming. Um, and based on the gaps that were identified through the barriers assessment in particular, um, as part of those protection mainstreaming efforts, humanitarian actors have been implementing some uh, concrete activities um, um, aiming to again improve access uh, for persons with disabilities. Uh, camp, I'll just provide a few concrete examples. Camp management agencies are delivering door-to-door -door messages on access to services such as health, food, and etc., for persons with disabilities because the lack of information on services that are available, uh, the distance from distribution points uh, have been identified as uh, key barriers. So we have now uh, in some, uh, in Rakhine in particular, we have care management agencies delivering door-to-door -door messages. They are also organizing transportations every week for persons with disabilities to better access health facilities to uh, access food assistance. We are doing also uh, distribution of NFIs at the household level in the shelter where you have persons with disabilities living. The WASH actors have been doing really um, a lot of work around protection mainstreaming, including around disability inclusion. They have installed courts to guide the way to the toilets for blind persons. They have um, installed special toilet seats um, at household level. So we have, and we have also been working um, on some uh, new shelter design to prevent protection uh, risks, but also uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, respond to the specific needs of uh, persons with, with uh, disabilities with uh, physical impairment in particular in, in some locations. Uh, the other areas, um, where we've been trying really to, 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 to expand, it's really the standalone project for persons with disabilities. And I have to say, this is an area where our efforts, our collective efforts, not only the protection sector, all clusters, uh, this is where we really need to, to, to boost our, our efforts. Um, we have uh, the Victim Assistance Center supported by HI and Physical Rehabilitation Centers as well as mobile repair workshops that are run by ICRC. These are really the most, I would say, important project for persons with disabilities, which benefit not only landmine victims in Myanmar, but all persons with physical impairments. And the approach is quite a holistic one, where we include not only physical rehabilitation, but also livelihood support. Maybe another uh, concrete project that I would like to highlight here is one that has been implemented by UNHCR since 2017. Um, again, it's a project that is really specific for, for persons with disabilities. It's a photo storytelling project. We have uh, partnered with a group of professional photographers uh, who are also the one organizing the Yangon Photo Festival, and they are providing a 12-day training on photo storytelling to IDPs who are living with disabilities in IDP camps. Uh, in, in Kachin, in the northern part of Myanmar. Um, and the project is really about empowering persons with disabilities, uh, allowing them to tell their own stories, giving them a voice in their community but also beyond. Uh, we also uh, make sure to include persons with physical but also mental impairments. With, um, the, we've observed that the negative attitudes and stigma against persons with intellectual impairments are even more acute. 
so we make sure that we have persons with different kind of impairments that can participate um, in this training. Um, and the participants produce their own photo stories. Um, it's really about their life, about the challenges they face in displacement, but it's also about the opportunities that they have identified. Um, and those participants compete in the Yangon Photo Festival. Um, and having those, uh, and we invite them to come to the festival in Yangon, and having persons with disabilities talk about their life, the challenges they face, the, the opportunities they see, uh, has proven to be really a very powerful uh, tool. Um, and um, in, in, in 2017 and 2018 uh, festivals, uh, uh, IDPs with disabilities have actually won some prizes in the emerging photographers category. So for us, it's really uh, this, this project uh, has, proven, uh, has, has provided a great opportunity to raise awareness about the challenges that IDPs with, disabi with disabilities face in Myanmar, but it's also raising an awareness about their extraordinary resilience and, and the potential and that they can exploit with a little bit of, of, of support. Uh, maybe to, to conclude, um, I would like to say that while I feel that in Myanmar we've made significant progress on the issue of disability inclusion of, over the past few years, there is still a very long way to go. Uh, this year we will try to expand targeted programming um, in the areas of provision of assisting devices, which is really a, a, quite a, a gap area that has been identified um, in the area of psychosocial support, empowerment, social inclusion, and we will also need to strengthen our efforts um, in terms of monitoring and evaluating those um, activities, whether it's protection mainstreaming, whether it's targeting, targeted interventions, we, we also need to, um, to, to uh, do a better evaluation of, of, of these interventions. This is also very much in line with the protection sector strategy for 2019 and, and 2020. There are a large number of recommendations uh, from the barriers assessment that remain to be acted upon, and this is also something we want to, to work on uh, this year and, and in the years to come. Uh, we need to make much more noise about the specific situations of persons with disabilities in our operation. We feel that there is some momentum um, and, and we certainly need to um, secure more funding. And funding, we need to go beyond protection mainstreaming. I think we, are all, we all recognize the fact that we need to secure dedicated funding for targeted interventions. Uh, last month, uh, the team uh, in Myanmar that is managing the Myanmar Humanitarian Fund organized a workshop on disability inclusion. This was done with the support also from HI and ECHO. So this is really um, a very, this was very welcome. This is part of those efforts that are being undertaken uh, around disability inclusion. The protection sector is also advocating for uh, dedicating MHF funding. Uh, I believe there has been quite some progress made um, with the SURF uh, at the global level, and we would like to uh, follow that lead uh, with the country pool funds so that we see more um, uh, funding being allocated, being firewalled for projects for persons with disabilities, and we are advocating with the MHF Advisory Board in Myanmar. And again, um, looking at the disability inclusion uh, in, in in, in a holistic approach, this is certainly not the only r the responsibility of the protection sector alone. It's the, it's the whole of system responsibility and, and, and accountability. And uh, we really hope that the YAS guidelines on inclusion of persons with disability in humanitarian action will, we hope this will provide us with also an, op an excellent opportunity to put disability inclusion higher up on the agenda, certainly of the Myanmar HCT, and we will, be, uh, we will look at some uh, specific events we would like to organize um, around, uh, around this. I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Geraldine, for this. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to move now to Kirsten. Thank you very much, Molam, and thank you to everybody for the really interesting presentation.
I just wanted to pose a few questions to the group, which are the, the kinds of questions that we often get when we're out in the field. So the first question that we often hear is, do we always need to collect data in order to ensure an inclusive response? And to respond to this question, I might first hand over to Pauline and see if you have any brief reflections on this question. Thank you very much, Kirsten. It is indeed a question that, that we often uh, get asked. And I'll say that, no, it's not always needed to, to collect data, especially when, when secondary data exists. Uh, I would put a caveat saying it's important to reflect on the quality uh, of the secondary um, data available, but hopefully as we advance uh, towards more awareness on disability data, they will be more and more um, out there. When no secondary data uh, is available, it is very important to collect data on person with disability, um, but it does not always have to be quantitative. I think in my presentation, I went through a lot of quantitative ways to collect data, to understand prevalence, access, or disaggregate indicators, but there are also some qualitative uh, way um, to collect data on person with disability. Myanmar example was, was very uh, important for that. So I, I would recommend collecting to be able to, to get the information and design an inclusive response. But we do also understand the reality um, of the field and it's not always um, possible to collect uh, data on person with disability. And this is the prime example where reverting to secondary data or using the, the WHO 15% or higher, as Gopal said, uh, can also be a useful indicator to, to plan an inclusive response. Thanks a lot, Pauline. And Gopal, did you or anybody else have anything to add to that response? Um, thank you, Kirsten Gopal here. And I would just like to uh, uh, build on what uh, Pauline just uh, mentioned. Uh, in terms of data, you know, it, it is actually, it's different type of data, different type of information evidence that is required at different, uh, uh, different points of time uh, on persons with disabilities or on uh, issues related to persons with disabilities that would help us uh, to understand the situation better of uh, persons with disabilities, what they are facing, or, and also to monitor, monitor access. So uh, uh, what we often um, see is uh, the, feel, uh, the, uh, the understanding that we have to collect data on persons with disabilities. While that is extremely important, uh, there is other parts of the puzzle. For example, we need data on, on accessibility. How many schools, how many child-friendly spaces, how many food distribution points are accessible? Uh, unless we are able to, al alongside population level data on persons with disabilities, unless we are able to collect data on, on, on have information on accessibility, on number of service providers, uh, who, who provide inclusive services, service providers in an area who provide services uh, which are specific to persons with disabilities. So it's a vast range of this type of information that would help um, uh, make humanitarian response, humanitarian action uh, uh, more uh, inclusive. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that alongside population level data, which is extremely important, and uh, uh, we would re we require uh, other other type of information like accessibility, like uh, service providers, people who are providing services on disability, human resources, capacity on disability existing in an area. All this information is required to make humanitarian action more, more inclusive of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Gopal. Uh, one of the other questions that we often hear is, do we need disability experts? to be able to do proper needs assessment and to design an inclusive response. And for that, I wanted to maybe perhaps first ask Geraldine, if Geraldine, you have any reflections on that? Thank you, Christine. I thought you would ask the experts <laughs> first. I thought you would ask Pauline. Um, uh, certainly, I think, um, I think in Myanmar, it has been absolutely critical uh, to have the support from uh, really disability experts. Um, and uh, for example, we, you know, we organized with the support from HI, we organized an awareness raising session for the members of the protection uh, sector. Uh, and I have to say, it was quite an eye opener um, in terms of the lack of understanding of, I mean, from from the whole group, huh, 
of uh, you know um, uh, what what disability is, even starting you know from from the definition of disability, what disability inclusion means. So um, that has proven to be quite useful, and I think that we would need to have much more of these awareness raising session trainings among among humanitarian actors. Um, and uh, the, the, the support from, from also again from HI has been critical uh, to be able to conduct those um, uh, barriers um, assessment um, in, uh, in Rakhine, in Kachin. Um, uh, and it was quite clear when the training was organized for the enumerators that um, these, these colleagues had actually no idea um, of you know what uh, it, even you know the, the the basic definition of what impairment is, so I think it's absolutely uh, absolutely tr critical, and this is something that we intend to to continue in Myanmar. But I think it's also very important to uh, to to think um, uh, long term, make sure also that we build communities capacities. Uh, as humanitarian actors, we often tend to think a little bit <laughs> short term. Uh, so this is also one area where we, we are planning to step, step up our efforts. It's really on, on community-based protection and um, including on, 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 on disability-related uh, uh, issues. But I leave it to, to Pauline, I think, to, uh, to, uh, to share her views on this. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Geraldine. Uh, Pauline, was there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I know just to, to, to briefly add, um, I think there are more and more and more tools and resources out there, but that means that there is less and less need for, for experts on disability. The Washington Group questions, for example, are fairly easy to use. There's more and more guidelines around it. Um, there is also the humanitarian inclusion standard for all the people and people with disability and the upcoming YAS guidelines. So hopefully all those resources would mean that, you know, agencies are, are more able to, to collect uh, that data and, and plans for inclusive responses. But I, I would agree with Geraldine that at, at the moment there is a need for capacity building on, um, on disability and also for some more variant facilitated analysis where methodology um, is not standardized yet. Uh, there is a role at the moment that, that is filled by, by disability experts. And, and I would stress also the need to, to reach to organization of persons with disability um, that can have a real role to play um, at the moment on, on those two issues. Thanks, Pauline, and thank you everyone for, for your responses to the questions. I will hand back to Moham now. I think this is the, uh, we come to the end of our webcast today. Um, thank you again for the panelists for being with us. Thank you for Pauline and Geraldine for joining us. And thank you, Christine, uh, Kristen, for, for the help and support that you provided. Thank you, everyone, everyone again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.